Hello, and welcome to Learning Music with Pat. Now, I've been showing you various instruments, and on the last segment, I showed you instruments from Peru and from other countries, India particularly, and uh, some of the Caribbean instruments. But I want to review one of these instruments because somebody showed me what these animals were. When I showed you instruments uh, like this, I talked about this fawn-looking instrument on the top. It comes out most clearly in this. Or if I twist it like this, you can tell me, Rick, if this works. Okay. Now, I've been saying it looked like a fawn, it looked like a deer, uh, but uh, my director here said he actually thinks it's a llama, and I think it's right. There are several of these Caribbean instruments that I have that have that sim same design on it. They also have birds and flowers and so forth, but I have two or three that have the same kind of uh, animal on it, and I've been referring it as looking like a deer or a fawn, but as he pointed out, this morning, I think he, it's right. I think he's right that it's probably a llama. So, if you want to redirect your thinking, I may have made a mistake on that. It's just as decorative, but it's always nice to know what you're looking at, too. So, I'm considering that to be a llama, and I think that's probably what it really is. So, I just want to kind of keep you in tune with that. Now, I still have some more instruments that I want to show you from different parts of the world. This one here, I'm not sure where it's from, but it's a Caribbean instrument. The mouthpiece is most unusual in the fact that it's not there. You know? uh, basically, what you have is you have a little, I'm going to try to rotate this so you can see it. You've got a little dip, a little nick in the wood. It's raw, a, a little kind of a U-shaped right there. And the rest of it, it's like a plain tube. I can take and I can look through this. I can see the television monitor. There's nothing obstructing it. The top is open, and there's just that little nick where my finger is now, and somehow you blow. And I've been able to make tones on it, but I'm not going to try it because it's not consistent. It's just very, very different. It's, it's an end-blown flute. But the end-blown flutes are usually all covered with a slit, and that's how you play them. You have your, your mouth over that slit, blow into it, and then the air comes out the labium and makes a tone. This one doesn't have it. It's just a simpler design, and it does play tones, and I have used it for that. But I would never try it to to play a song with, but isn't it unusual? It's plain. It has a uh, little um, has a little tone hole in the back, and as with most of the Caribbean instruments, the tone hole is a little higher than your index finger, which is unusual. It does have this little uh, threads on it. This is just decorative. It doesn't actually do anything, and the tone holes though do vary in size. If I can get this out here, you can see that there is one here that's a lot smaller than the other. It does play. It's a little thicker bamboo. And as I said last time, and I want, just want to reiterate it, is that these bamboo instruments, usually the bamboo is thin. The instruments are not that expensive. They're beautiful, but they're not that expensive. And when you blow into it for weeks or months, however long you're playing it, they're apt to get a little slit, a little split in them. And if you continue playing them, that continues in size, and after a while you can't use the instrument at all. So it's better not to use it. Here's an another end blown flute and I want to get this so you can see it. You can see that there's a block. You can see the block. The block is it's just a, a, a two levels, two different colors of wood with a little slit and that little slit is where you blow in. It replaces or acts as the mouthpiece, and the labium is going to be on the back side of it. So if I play the instrument, I'm just going to blow it for you, but where the tone holes are in the front, and the labium is in the back toward me if I'm playing it. I'm only going to make some sounds on it, but before I do, look at the decorations. I'm not sure what country this is from. It is a Caribbean country, I believe, but isn't that nice? Just a really nice, simple design. It really looks good. No design on the back, 
and no tone hole on the back. So you only get the design uh, as I'm rotating it, holding it up for you in the front. That's all the place that, that's the only design that it has. If I blow into it, I put my lips over the little slit that's in the, the, what's supposed to be the mouthpiece. The air will come out in the back and I'll get a tone out of that. And it's not a bad little tone, but that's, that's the way you do it. When you get down here, it doesn't play as well. It's not exactly in pitch with itself. So at any rate, that's the way you play an end blown flute. You put your mouth over the slit, so you're blowing into it. The air comes out the labium, wherever it is. Sometimes it's in the front, sometimes it's in the back. And then you use your tone holes, and you can get tones out of it, and you can get a little scale out of it. I would never use it in an orchestra. I would never use it you know, for, for any kind of real music. But that's the way it is. And some of these things, I think, are made basically for uh, you know, artifacts for the public just for their enjoyment, but not to be used for serious music. This is a recorder, a regular recorder. It's from West Germany. It's a Sonata from Germany. It plays really well. It's a wooden instrument. A lot of times it's not bamboo. Uh, a lot of times those wooden instruments are more expensive than regular instruments because they have a good quality of tone and so it's considered to be better than, than your plastic ones. Wooden clarinets. I have a wooden clarinet and uh, it's, it's a cabart. It's a French make. It's one of the top French makes of clarinet. And I, you have to oil them every so often, you know, so that they don't split. But they are considered to be very expensive and very nice instruments. Well, this is the one from Germany that's wood. Let me see. And you know it has a really quite a nice tone to it. The block is hard to see. I'm not sure whether you can pick it up or not. But there is a block there, the same color as the regular wood. But you can see a little line where the block is. That's a part of the mouthpiece, of course. And uh, this little guy comes from China. This is a Chinese instrument. Now, China makes everything, and a lot of the instruments that I have may be Chinese, but this is made to look like a Chinese instrument, and uh, it, you can pull it apart. It has this little decorative uh, label on it. I don't know what it's for. I think it's just for decoration. It doesn't do anything. Let me hold it up. I have other blue ones similar to it that I can pull apart. This can be pulled apart too. And it's actually quite a nice instrument. If you look in the back, it has kind of an insignia. It has some kind of a label on it. And uh, it's, uh, I don't know what that means. I don't know what that's for because I don't speak Chinese. It came with the case, and I'll show you the case because you'll get some kind of an idea as what the Chinese language, I, I don't speak or read Chinese, so I can't read it. It also came with an instruction book, which I'll show you a little bit of. Uh, and the instruction book is all China, all written in Chinese. And I don't know if I'm holding it upside down or right side up. I'll show both sides. This must be right. And they evidently make several instruments because they have pictures of the instruments that they produce. So, and it also has an uh, unusual uh, fingering chart. So I think this is right side up, even though the, it, it, even though, yeah, because the numbers are right. So it shows the instrument as if 
the, it looks to us like it's upside down, but if you were to pick it up and, and put it in your mouth, it would make sense to look at it this way. So at any rate, this is a Chinese instrument. It does play fairly well. The, it does have a little problem on, um, has a little problem on octaves. does quite well and uh, once again I'll just hold it like this you can see the little decorative piece in the in the front of it there and if I hold it in the back you can see the symbol whatever that means and it's it's a nice it really is a nice instrument it really is it will it would be comparable to uh, some of the instruments that I have. I have another blue one like here. They look somewhat alike. This is an American made. They do look somewhat alike. But mine, I use it because I can take it apart. And if I want to show how an instrument is made, I can just simply pull it apart. Now, I don't like to pull all of them apart. I can do it. Most of them have the ability to do that. Here's the neck, the uh, head joint off. But the reason I don't is I, I have these adjusted so that they will play in the best pitch possible. And if I just take them apart and put them together, I may disrupt that and I'd have to reset them again. Not that I can't do it. It's easy enough to do, but why spend the time when I have one that I can use for that purpose? I do have most instruments, as you know, can be split, and I just did it with that wood, when you can take the foot joint, the body, and the head joint and separate them. But not all instruments can do that. This is recorder-like. I say recorder-like. It's meant to be like a recorder. It's a beautiful color. I love the instrument. The color is just gorgeous. It's one of my favorite colors. It is designed, even though it may be hard to see it, to, to be like a recorder. It's got a little hump down here, but you can't split it apart. Some of them you can split apart and some of them you can't. This does play. It plays kind of after a fashion. It has a little plastic block in the back. You can probably see it because the color's a little bit different, just enough. I gotta learn to slant these when I hold them because the light hits them. When the light reflects off of them, you can see them better. I am gonna play this. This is a little hard to play. There's a tone hole in the back. It's a little hard to play in the ba and from the basis that you have to get a certain amount of air in it before it's willing to blow any kind of a tone out. See, I can't get any octaves. The octaves are just not there. and it's like it hesitates and then after it hesitates the, the note comes out I have no idea why it does that because it's made like any other recorder except you can't split it apart some instruments you can split part of them apart but not all of them um, I don't have any of mine well this one here here's the gill there's no, it's the, the body and the foot joint are like joined, they're all together. You can take the head joint off, but you can't take the rest of it off. It just doesn't work. The instruments, most of them, except for the wooden ones, not so much on the wooden ones, but most of them, you can take the head joint, the body, and the, and the foot joint off, and that's good for cleaning. But some of them you can only take the head joint off. Some of them you can't take any of the joints off. I mean, they're just one solid piece, and that's a lot of these instruments that are made out of wood that comes from other countries. There's no way to clean them. The only thing you could do would be to take some warm water and go over it. You wouldn't want to add soap or anything harsh, and you certainly can't use alcohol or anything like that, because if you do use alcohol, you will split the wood, and then the instrument is not good so you just can't do that so I'm watching my time here 
Um, I have some pictures I'd like to show you of instruments that, that uh, we'll start with this one here, but you've seen this before. I have various types of woodwinds on this, and then I'm going to switch, and I have, I have uh, instruments, let's see as we get the camera adjusted here a little. Well, let me go ahead with this. This, I've had some of these, ah, that's good. Uh, I've had some of these instruments in before. I didn't bring them in today. I can only carry so much. But here's your, your sasuto. Here's your penny whistle. Here's your recorder. Uh, here's your tonette and your song flute, the uh, flutophone, and a regular instrument. What I decided to do, I, I was going to try to get a class together where I just show um, the mouthpieces. So what I ended up by doing was going to a photocopy place. I just want to flip this one more page. And I actually took photocopies of the instruments. Now, I don't know as they were aware I was doing that. I, tow I put towels around them so that uh, I could get them looking. You could see more of the instrument, not of my hand holding them in place or something like that. So we can go on with this. Yeah, this is good. This is a little recorder. This does not come apart, but it shows you what it looks like in the front. This is equivalent of the head joint, the body, and the foot joint. This is a little one. I have had it in before, but I want to compare mouthpieces, which is why I have these pictures uh, together here. I've made a bunch of them. Here is that same recorder on its side. You can see this is a fipple mouthpiece. You can see a little bit of the labium, the head joint, and then the foot joint and the body. But you can see how the mouthpiece is shaped. You can see that labium and all recorders are like that. I chose this little one because I can practically photocopy it full size so you get a chance to see it better. Here's another one where it's laying on its, it, this is a tone hole in the back, it's laying face down practically. And uh, there it's, uh, you can see the curve of the instrument, you can't see the labium, this is a tone hole in the back. So you get a, a chance to see how these instruments are made. Here is that same recorder with a penny whistle. This is a little penny whistle in the key of G. It's a small one, but you can see the similarities of the mouthpieces. Here we go with the labium. The labium, a little bit different shape. This area is kind of longer and more narrow with the penny whistles than they are with the recorders, but there's a lot of similarity between them. I have some more pictures of them together in this Part, you see the, the back side, this is laying more on its side. It's very hard to get these pictures, by the way. The instruments keep on rolling around in the glass. So what I tend to do is put towels around them to help to keep them in place. It may not be the most artistic way to do it, but it's probably better than seeing my hand, which is hidden behind the towel. And, uh, but this is the way they are. And uh, I don't know as a photocopy place realized that I was using a color photocopier for this. Here they are. They roll together. I thought I had them separated, but they roll together. But it's good they're both on this side. You can see that labium. You can see the differences in the penny whistle. The mouthpiece is actually thinner on top than in the recorder. This is the smallest uh, recorder that I have. It does play, but it's more of a novelty item. And I use the smaller instruments because I can get better pictures. They're not sticking off the machine. Now I want to show you, these are conicals. These are conical instruments. Um, not cylindrical because they come more to a point. And these are the sweet tones that I showed you before that I have brought in. One is red and one is green. And I put a special towel on them to keep them together. I think it takes an engineer to do this, really. Here they are together, and you can see more that they're at a point. This one, you can see it better than in the green one. But they're both made by the same company. They're made by Clarks, and they're called Sweet Tones, and they are made in England. 
I think what I'm, I'm not going to have too much chance to finish it. This is a Shaw's. This Shaw's uh, is also a cylindrical. It comes to kind of a point. It's silver. It's actually in the key of E. And it just has, it, does, it has the, the uh, labium, but all you see is a little window that is called a window. And you don't see the lip or the slanted part. It's not there. And you can see uh, that if I put it on the side, you can see how the, it is shaped. And there is a wooden plug in there. And I'm going to show that to you. Actually, I like that photo. I like the way the silver comes. Here is the um, wooden plug. You can see it looks like a little beige because these are all in color. Even though they're white, they're all in color. And this is the little wooden plugged fippled mouthpiece that you see on that instrument. Now, we're getting close to time, so I really think, oh, this is an instrument that I showed you. Remember I showed you the end blown flute, and it had this kind of design, and you can see part of my hand holding it in place. I am going to close it here because I have more to show you, and I just don't have the time to do it. So I think next time I'm going to go through these pictures so that you can see more what these instruments are like with the shape of their mouthpieces because they are, they're very similar in many respects, but there are some differences. There are some differences in the fingering patterns, but not much, and there is some differences in the mouthpieces. So I want to go into mouthpieces, how important they are. I may include the reeded instruments like the saxophones and the clarinets and the flutes and so forth along with that. So we'll have a segment just on mouthpieces, and you'll have a chance to see how they are. I've given you kind of an introduction to that with the last two shows, so we'll continue with that next time. So I'll close it here. Please join me next time.